All right, The Dream Whisper is a new documentary that spends the better part of a decade following Dr. Dick Barnett, the captain of the Tennessee a and basketball team that won three straight national titles between 1957 and 1959 uh, on Barnett's quest to get Tennessee a and into the Basketball Hall of Fame. The doc will appear on PBS stations throughout February and be available on the PBS app on February 1st. Eric, Eric Drath is the director and executive producer of the Dream Whisperer. And Eric, I, I watched, I, I'm familiar with, with Dick's story and, and the mission that he had, uh, but I watched it with someone that was completely unfamiliar with it. And th this person was watching with me, with, like throughout the documentary, you know, found herself rooting for, you know, this to play out the right way. Like it was kind of like, it, it, is he still alive? Is, is his team going to get in? Because it became like engrossing in that sense. So I encourage people, even if, you know, if you know the outcome of the documentary or the end results, uh, watch it with somebody that has no idea because it, it, it reels them in pretty quickly. Yeah. Thank, thanks. Um, yeah, it's kind of like the Titanic. You know what's going to happen at the Titanic, but it's still a great movie. I'm not saying it's a great movie like the Titanic. It's a great movie on its own. But um, certainly uh, when we started this uh, long journey, and it was 11 years in the filming and about 12 years altogether uh, to make the film, you know, the odds of getting into the Hall of Fame were stacked way against us. Uh, I don't even know if they qualified at that point uh, to be on the, the consideration list. Um, but, um, you know, it was Dick Barnett's determination to keep going. Uh, that's just infectious. And we just said, you know, we're just going to keep going and see whatever happens. You know, if, if they didn't get in, that would be the story too. Um, but we knew that the story itself based in 57, 58, 59 was interesting enough and powerful enough to make a documentary on its own. I mean, this is a team that against all odds, as HBCU, a historically bl black university and college, you know, played in the integrated play and won three championships in a row. I mean, nobody had three-peated at that point and nobody's three-peated since in basketball like that. So we knew we had a story and the fact that it was lost in history made it even more intriguing and then contemporary following Dick Barnett, trying to get the world to pay attention and to listen and to remember this team seemed like a perfect fit. But I think a lot of people are familiar with the story of Texas Western, which was obviously immortalized in Hollywood in Glory Road. This story, Tennessee A and I preceded Texas Western. I mean, they went through, you know, a lot, you know, during that time, um, you know, the Jim Crow era in the U S uh, I know that a lot of this flowed from George Willis's column, my friend formerly with the New York post, just kind of walk me through the Genesis of all this and why you believe this was worth the investment. I mean, I said the top better part of 10 years, more than 10 years, obviously to put this, uh, this whole documentary together. Well, I, you know, I share the same admiration for, for uh, George as, as, you, as you do. I mean, George is a, a top-notch journalist. And, and when his article came out in the Post about Dick Barnett and, you know, you know trying to get some attention for this team, um, it was actually sent to me by the executive producer, Ed Peskowitz, who is a lifelong basketball fan, just an incredible guy. And, uh, you know, said, wouldn't this be a great story? He had seen the documentary that I did for ESPN, one of the 30 for 30s called Renee on Renee Richards. And he reached out to me out of the blue and said, you know, would this be a good story? And I said, yeah, this would be a great story. I just didn't know that it would be such a long journey. So when we started filming, uh, you know, the odds were against us, like I said, but but we just kept going, you know, and, and obviously when you're doing a project like this, it's not like 11 years of every day working on it. I, I produced and directed a bunch of films in between the time we started and the time we finished. Uh, but this always was calling my name. This was always getting back to us. And, and Dick and I had this little funny thing. He called me up and he'd go, TSU, which man, get on it. We're going, <laughs> we're going to the garden to see uh, Clyde Frazier and Spike Lee or, we're going to see Al Sharpton, or we're going here to Tennessee State to 
to, to try to get the president to do something. So I knew when he called, it's time to fire up the cameras and, and, and pack my bags. Yeah, and that just spoke to Dick Barnett's passion for, you know, this. Um, you know, a lot of the people he talked to, I, I don't want to use the word ambush because it has a negative connotation, but like he just walked right up to Spike Lee and said, we got to make something happen. Walked up to Clyde in the garden, footage that is on the documentary. As you mentioned, going to Tennessee State and, you know, you know, forcing these meetings to to get people involved. Al Sharpen forcing him to to get involved. Why did you find him to be so passionate about this for so long? You know, it's just in his DNA. It's the same way that he practiced. I mean, you know, talk about a guy who just would, you know, shoot and shoot and shoot. You know, Senator Bradley talks about it. I mean, he's just got this uh, persistence and determination unlike anyone that I've ever seen. And, and similar to the way he played, because, you know, he was on the great 70 and 73 Knicks teams that won championships. He wasn't a big talker. He led by how he played. And he led this movie by what he did, not what he said. Obviously, he, you know, would say, you know, certain things. But I really learned a lot making this, this film with him and seeing him just, you know, just go up to everyone. And, and one of the things that, that I kind of realized watching the film recently, because, you know, you make these films and you just watch them and you watch them for, for, for all kinds of reasons. You know, after they won their championships, you know, they didn't have the national acclaim that a team today might have. They didn't go to the White House. They didn't, uh, you know, they weren't on the, the, the boxes, uh, the Cheerio boxes. They went back to Nashville because that's where the school was. And they were in the sit-ins. They participated in the protest. They were going for, for equal rights for, for, for black people at the time. So they went to sit-ins in, at the lunch counters where they sat in the white uh, seat only area. They were spit on. People threw uh, milkshakes on them. They were humiliated, but they stood there and took it with grace and dignity. And what I realized is that that must have had such a impact on him that now a guy like Spike Lee blowing him off doesn't deter him. He keeps going. And, you know, like I learned a lot, like, yeah, that's how you make get things done. You don't react and get all emotional and, and cry like a baby. You say, okay, not this place, but I'm going to go to the next. Why do you think it took as long as it did to get this team into the hall of fame? I have to imagine that, that you believed at different points that it would happen before 2019, that, you know, this is a, a ready-made story for the hall of fame, you know, a pioneering all black team um, winning three straight national championships. There, there are, I don't want to say lesser figures, but there are, are less qualified, I would say hall of fame inductees than this Tennessee a and I team. Why do you think it took as long as it did? I don't think that they had the political and PR machine behind them. First of all, TSC. It's kind of a shame that you need that though, right? Like, I mean, the story should speak for itself. If you if, like, it's kind of like that old saying, like you got one job, Hall of Fame. Like, you know, your one job is to identify stories of this caliber and, you know, execute what you're supposed to execute. Yeah. And I, I mean, even when it was brought to their attention that there was such an oversight, it still took all of these years to finally get them in. And it, I think one of the reasons is, is that, you know, it wasn't like commercially, you know, um, opportunistic for them to go in. It was, it was, you know, there weren't big dollars behind this. There wasn't some big, you know, campaign that could go behind this. This was one man's journey to make the world hear it. And we thought that that was something worth telling. You know, so that's that's exactly, you know, why this is got done. It's because of Dick Barnett. Yeah. And I don't know if there's a villain in a story like this, but I got to tell you, Eric, the president of the Hall of Fame has a little villain in him, it seems like. Or he, he gets the you you kind of look at him and you you squint a little bit at him. You get a little angry at him for some of his explanations as to why this uh this team didn't get in the hall of fame. And one of the things that was notable to me, and again, I encourage everybody to watch it from start to finish at, at the very end when, and I'm blanking on his name. You obviously know what I'm blanking at the top of my head, but he, 
he walks over to Dick Barnett uh, shortly after Dick gets there and Dick's sitting in a cushioned chair and he sort of pats it or whatever you need. And you kind of let the key and then he walks away and Dick looks like he's just sort of staring at him and you let the shot linger for a minute. And because you let it linger for a minute, it got people like me and, and people I was, that have watched it uh, thinking like, you know, it, it, you can almost, if you were writing like a, a, a subtext to it, it would just be like, you know, and he looked, if you, you look long and hard at the man that's been keeping him out. Like, how did you view that moment? Am I misinterpreting that? Not at all. In fact, it could have been a lot worse with the footage we had. We, we, it wasn't, uh, you know, the footage speaks for itself. It could have actually told much worse volumes. Uh, we actually went to some lengths to, 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 to try to not bury anybody. But, but, but the individual you're talking about was just the spokesperson and the figurehead for the institution. Mm -hmm. So he was communicating what the institution was telling him. He wasn't, you know, in a vacuum here. Um, you know, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the Hall of Fame and the NBA are basically the same. You know, the board members are all part of the NBA. The NBA funds a lot of the, the Hall of Fame. And the NBA also owns most of the footage that's on the Hall of Fame. So Dick Barnett was never a commercially bankable type of star. He was the guy that stood up and called a spade a spade. And, and that's what you got to love about him, you know, and, and that's probably why it probably worked against him also and against the team. You had an interview in there with David Stern, who of course passed away in 2020. You say the NBA has you know, a powerful influence over the Hall of Fame. Um, wh what was Stern's position on all this? I mean, you would think is the commissioner of the NBA and one of the more heavy-handed commissioners you're going to find during his days. Uh, he, he could have pushed it through if he really wanted to. What was your your reaction or your takeaways from speaking to David Stern? Well, well, I think our timing in that regard was not the best. I mean, I think David Stern was an ex incredible, incredible uh, commissioner, incredible man. He did so much for the sport of basketball. Mm. And he even says in his interview, sometimes we get it wrong and mm. we need to go back and fix things. I mean, he says it. And, and I believe that he would have had he lived longer. But not long after the interview, he passed away, unfortunately. And I think, I don't think the, the new commissioner saw this and said, no, I just think it didn't get to his desk in time. Mm. So I think that it was just a, a confluence of, of timing uh, and bad timing for the, the team's uh, message to get to the highest office. So I don't think it was intentional at that point. I think Stern would have done something about it had he could. But, you know, again, it is a democratic process. So even though the, the NBA has a very heavy hand in the institution of the hall of fame there are votes that are required mm -hmm. now they've created a uh, new commission you know uh, subcommittees for schools like this that might have been uh, overlooked and, and they might not go in the traditional way but i don't believe that um that that the that the current commissioner was trying to keep the team out you know one of the things i thought was was interesting um was, you know, it's one thing to be unknown or kept out of the Basketball Hall of Fame, a national global institution. When you went back to, you know, to Tennessee and we're interviewing kids on campus and I think some faculty members even on campus, like they didn't know anything about this team, you know, that was there. I mean, how how surprised were you to find out that even, you know, in his own backyard that, you know, those championship teams just didn't resonate? Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, it's hard to, to point fingers, but for whatever reason, the school completely dropped the ball on this. And they even admitted, I'm, mm -hmm. Teresa Phillips, who's an extraordinary uh, individual, she played, she was the athletic director, she says it in the film, somehow we missed the ball here, you know, and there was, it was almost like, you know, there was no um, effort until we started. And even when we started, it was hard to get the school to take it serious. They, you know, as you'll see in the film, and I don't want to give away the whole film, but I think it's it, in the totality, it's still worth watching. But, you know, he goes to the school and they send him to the Greek organizations. I mean, 
I don't know how powerful the Greek organizations <laughs> are in your college, if, you know, but if you had them, but in our school, we were, we were fighting for an existence. So mm -hmm. sending, sending something to the Greek organizations was almost sending it, you know, uh, to, to, you know, to, you know, nowhere. So, so again, you know, the school didn't really have the wherewithal to, to, to promote it. You know, they did show up when they finally got to the, the hall of fame, some of these, you know, but, but the school definitely um, carries some responsibility for letting this story kind of fade off and for, you know, not communicating to the students today how important this story is, not just for Tennessee, but for all HBCUs and for America to know what happened when we were integrating, when these, you know, championships were being played and under what circumstances they were being played. This was as we've noted a uh, long process with for Dick Barnett, I'm sure a lot of disappointments along the way, as you were kind of immersed in this, did you ever feel like he was ready to give up? If he was, he never showed that he was, mm -hmm. um, I probably was ready to give up more than he was, uh, you know, but I just said, let's keep going. I mean, he, this guy has just got the determination like no other, uh, you know, even today. And what brings us to this interview and should not be uh, forgotten is that there's an effort now uh, to get the team, the last remaining living players of the team to the white house, finally mm -hmm. to, you know, to, for their, finally their, their, their moment in the sun. I mean, think about it now, every team that wins a national championship, the next day, they're reporting the Biden administration, the Trump administration, whatever administration is calling that team for their moment at the highest office in our great country. Mm -hmm. This team did it three times, got nothing. And now we're needing to just fight for them to even acknowledge it again. So we're hoping that right now, over 50 Congress uh, people s signed a letter that the Biden administration will take a look at this and they'll do something about it. And I have to tell you another thing that's been really frustrating is that the vice president's office started a whole commission for HBCUs. And the chair of that commission is the president of TSU. And still nothing has happened for over two years. We've implored the president of TSU, say something, do something, nothing has happened. So I call this out because it's important to call it out. And Dick Barnett would call it out. Sometimes it's not the most uh, pretty and, and friendly, but it needs to be called attention to. These guys deserve their moment. They're gonna come in wheelchairs if it happens. They're gonna come on crutches. They'll come on, on gurneys if they have to, but they will be there to recognize what they did, not for them, but for the country. 87 years old. Is he still calling you to chat about this stuff? He calls me all the time. <laughs> TSU. That's what he says. That's my call. TSU. Yeah. In fact, I, I saw him uh, very recently and, mm -hmm. and you know, he's getting old and this is a story in a film about aging too. Not only does the story age in time, but the individuals in age in time. And a lot of people passed away in the making of this film, Anthony Mason, McClendon's widow, some of the old coaches, Coach uh, John Thompson, who speaks in it, uh, uh, Commissioner Stern. You know, how many people need to die now before this is finally recognized at the White House? So, you know, I don't know what's after the White House, but Dick will probably <laughs> find something. Well, I think it's certainly worth that recognition, that honor, that distinction to get a White House visit for those last remaining members uh, of that team. Uh, Eric, it's a terrific documentary. The Dream Whisperer is available on PBS stations throughout February, available on the PBS app on February 1st. Terrific stuff, Eric, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Chris. Great seeing you again.